Hello there, welcome to this edition of Global Business Africa. In the next half hour, we'll make a speed run through all the key business news stories you need to know about from across the African continent. From Cairo to Lagos, Nairobi and Johannesburg, we've got you covered. Here's what's coming up. The Naira and the Rand have both hit record lows this month and they're heading lower. We'll be looking at the prospects going forward. Banking in Somalia is getting quite the revival. We'll have the details from Mogadishu. And fish farmers in Egypt are exploiting the export market to revive and increase their fortunes. Well then, let's start as we have pretty much for the last couple of weeks in oil. Brent crude fell more than a dollar to another new five-year low on Wednesday as producers forecast much lower demand for oil next year. In a monthly report, the organization of the petroleum exporting countries forecast demand for the group's oil will fall to 28.19 million barrels a day in 2015. That's down by about a quarter of a million barrels a day from its previous forecast. The price of North Sea oil benchmark crude is down by over 40 percent since June as new supplies of high quality crude from North America have essentially fed a glut in many oil markets around the world. Brent futures for January were down to $65.24 a barrel. That's the lowest level since September 2009. They did recover slightly thereafter, however. Now, while falling oil prices do spell good fortune for economies that are net oil importers, exporters, which are over-reliant on oil revenue, are paying a fairly dear price. Case in point, Nigeria, Africa's biggest economy, the Naira, has recorded its worst drop this month, hitting lows of 187.55 to the dollar last week, despite central bank intervention. The unit traded between 180 and 181 to the dollar on Wednesday. That's a level that's still pretty far from the central bank's target range of 168 naira to the dollar plus or minus five percent now the rand has also been on the receiving end and this one is a result of a wide current account deficit the reserve bank reported the deficit narrowed to six percent of gdp that was a lot more than what the market had expected at about 5.8 percent and that sent the south african rand tumbling south africa is a net crude importer and this of course has prevented it from benefiting properly from falling oil prices. Let's get you some insight into what's going on with African currencies. Uh, Bridget Taylor is the CEO at Intrepid Capital. She's live in Johannesburg with us tonight. Thank you for your time. Um, the Naira has been trading outside the CBN's target range even after devaluation. Should we expect another cut from the CBN or just more aggressive liquidity management? I would expect more uh, drastic liquidity management. I think that this is something that we're going to really be facing in 2015 as commodity prices continue to deteriorate, um, as the global growth scenario continues to remain relatively benign. Um, certainly, you know, something that we need to consider as um, African countries and as well as emerging markets that have a commodity-based um, sector that relies on our exports. So from that perspective, I think with this China growth scenario um, possibly deteriorating to 7%, that obviously poses poses significant risks on African currencies that have that commodity-based underlying issue. I'd still like to focus on Nigeria. Um, aside from pre-election risk aversion and an aversion, of course, to emerging market assets as a whole ahead of the Fed raising rates sometime in the first half of next year, what other risk factors are influencing the Naira's mm. direction? Well, I think that predominantly it's going to be around the oil price. I mean, at the moment, uh, oil is front and center. We've had, you know, various uh, notifications out of those that are part of the OPEC body. And, and I think almost 10 out of the 12 are under a lot of pressure with regards to actually meeting their costs. So from that perspective, it's going to be interesting to see whether or not OPEC comes up um, with some form of solution around the oil price. But for now, um, oil continues to deteriorate. And as such, we can expect further pressure on the Naira. Indeed. And OPEC's response so far has been to essentially keep production at current levels. Um, let's turn to South Africa. Between the slower growth over there and the load shedding, is a short-term forecast for the RAND all negative? Is there no single source of fundamental support for the RAND? 
Well, I think that there's a couple of issues at play here. I mean, if we look at the African currencies, we look at the Kenyan shilling specifically as well. We are in December. There's a lot of imports going through the market ahead of the holiday season. So the import market is driving currencies a little bit weaker. However, on the back of that, there are also negative fundamentals in South Africa specifically. I mean, you mentioned earlier the current account deficit. It's certainly something that we need to um, address in South Africa, particularly around the ratings agencies and particularly around our budget going into February next year. However, from a fundamental perspective, that balancing of the economy is very difficult in an environment where we really do rely heavily, and this brings in um, the other African countries that have that export sector with regards to commodities. If we see a slowdown in China, how do we maximize on the weakness of our currency? So how do we bring um, you know, money back on book to negate those kinds of deficiencies in an economy where there's really no demand for our export sector, um, whereas our imports continue to become more and more expensive. And those imbalances look likely to remain for the foreseeable future. As you mentioned with regards to Eskom, that certainly is a massive issue with regards to the South African economy specifically. Just from a sentiment perspective around business and the sustainability of business in this environment where the electricity supply certainly is under a lot of pressure. Indeed. Earlier this year, the story about African currencies was really just focused on the SEDI in Ghana. It stabilized a bit against the dollar since September. Is that stability at risk given the fall in oil prices that we're seeing now? I think it is at risk and I think that we must keep that in mind if you're looking at the underlying fundamentals uh, pertaining to the African currencies look at things around which commodities are being impacted uh, which commodity um, export sector is predominant within that region or within that country and how that's going to be impacted going forward specifically if we look at the Chinese scenario around their deteriorating growth outlook however I, th I have to applaud the African countries specifically if we look at the likes of Kenya Ghana Zambia etc even Mauritius stepping up to the plate with regards to their central bank intervention and trying to do something from a more um, you know a, a advantageous kind of uh, perspective in order to protect the currency from the fallout that is being experienced as this risk of trade persists. Indeed a uh, final question to you investors who probably bought euro bonds from frontier uh, markets like Nigeria, Kenya, Ghana are probably watching this what red flags should they look out for as these currencies weaken? Well, I think a couple of things. I think, you know, keep an eye on um, the what's, what's actually happening globally. I think that's going to be the key with regards to lower interest rates. Certainly expecting interest rates to remain low, if not uh, further quantitative easing out of the eurozone. We can expect the, U the U.S. themselves to remain flat for an extended period of time. We've got the Bank of Japan potentially embarking on further quantitative easing. And then you're looking at Bank of China. So the People Bank of China also under pressure. Um, from that perspective, we can continue to see foreign investment into the likes of um, liquid you know, bond markets in, in the um, African countries as well as into the currencies from a financial investment perspective. But I think that the key indicators that we need to watch out for is, as I said earlier, the commodity prices and those that particularly um, pertain to specific currencies, as you mentioned earlier, with regards to the Naira, with regards to Ghana, with regards to um, South Africa and the gold price. So those types of dynamics are going to sway the, uh, the investment portal with regards to where investment will find a home. Will it be in emerging markets outside of Africa or will it be in specific portals that are not that impacted by the commodity price fallout? Indeed. We'll have to leave there for the time being. Thank you for your input. That's Bridget Taylor. She's the chief executive at Intrepid Capital. She's live in Johannesburg, South Africa. Now then, Zimbabwe has gotten a $108 million grant from the African Development Bank to improve electricity and water supply. Its finance minister, Patrick Chinamasa, says a grant will be used to repair the Kariba Dam, which generates, of course, a bulk of Zimbabwe's electricity and transmission lines too. Water supplies in the second largest city of Bulawayo will also be improved. Zimbabwe currently owes foreign creditors like the African Development Bank, the World Bank, the IMF, $9 billion. Most of that is in arrears and therefore it's not been able to access fresh loans which it desperately needs to rebuild its crumbling infrastructure, roads, schools, hospitals, you name it. Zimbabwe is projected to spend 81% of its national budget on salaries for state workers next year and that of course does leave precious little to spend on infrastructure.
Now, for residents of Mogadishu, Somalia's capital, it must feel like a new building is popping up every other hour. The latest addition to their cityscape is a special one. It's the home of the International Bank of Somalia, the first financial institution of its kind over there in over two decades. Somalia is showing quite a bit of improvement ever since the financial sector pretty much collapsed in 1991. A plethora of money transfer companies known as Hawalas locally sprang up to cater for the millions of the diaspora who'd fled the country but still needed to regularly send cash back to the friends and family members whom they left behind. Now, while they facilitated the transfer of over a billion dollars a year, these Hawalas are confined solely to just handling incoming transactions after getting the remittance deposits due to the absence of a central governing body and fiscal legislation. In IBS, we are using international standards. We have risk management, we have compliance, we have anti-money laundering system, uh, we have name screening, uh, we have internal audit, we have external audit. We have all sorts of safeguards that makes us to connect to the world. That's the reason IBS have connections, correspondence around the world, which makes the money transferred through banking system easier, something which was not available in the country. The operating cost is in Somalia is very high. You have to depend everything by yourself, uh, or to yourself, and uh, that's a challenge. Uh, the other challenge is we need to educate people of how banking sector really works, or who benefits the banking sector. So banking, understanding banking, because people have some uh, their own mentality of how banks works. So some of the products that you are going to introduce, if you are not able to make adaptation with the local customers, uh, there will be a challenge. Quick run through the equity markets here for you. Plenty of red ink across the board, except for South Africa. The JC Ultra Index up by about six tenths. Everywhere else across the board, losses. The stock exchange in uh, Nigeria, the Ultra Index over there, down by over 200 basis points, and just about a tenth, or rather, a four percentage point lower in Egypt and in Nairobi. Mali's mango sector is thriving despite uh, Ebola's devastation of other bits of its economy. We'll tell you why. And we'll be giving you some contrarian opinions as Africa gears up to set up a continental free trade area. Sustainable development and a commitment to developing partnerships with Africa. Some of the key phrases already used at the Africa Global Business Forum here in Dubai. There is a need for a predictable environment in which investors have to put their money. Welcome back to the program. You're watching Global Business Africa. Now, over in West Africa, Mali aims to be the world's top exporter of mangoes. It has set itself a production target of 14,000 tons this year. You see, mango farming is a significant contributor to the country's economy. In What's Hot Tonight, to look at the impact this fruit has had on Mali's agricultural sector, despite having Ebola. Despite the spread of the Ebola virus taking a toll on many sectors of the economy in Mali, the agricultural sector continues to make major economic contributions. The humble mango is one of the major contributors to the agricultural system for the landlocked West African country. According to a recent United Nations Development Programme report, the country produces an estimated 12,000 tons of mangoes for export, a rate which is steadily growing. This year, mango production target has been set at 14,000 tons, which is valued at an estimated 40 million US dollars. 
In the Bamako region, the production reaches a level of 800 tons of mangoes for a total market value of 1 billion francs. The Kulkoro region produces mangoes worth 2 billion francs, and the biggest production figures are achieved by the Sikasso region. Nationwide, this year's production target is set at 14,000 tons, all types of mangoes included, for a 21 billion francs value. The economic success of the mango industry in the country could be attributed to agricultural scientists who made use of genetic technology to ensure all year supply of different mango species for farmers. First of all, it's about genetic diversity. We have indeed various types of mangoes here from which we manage the cycle of production, packaging and marketing of mangoes and processed products. So thanks to the selection and to our unit skills, we deal with more than a hundred varieties of mangoes. We do the grafting of the plants in the nursery you can see here. This is where it all begins and we are planning the grafting in line with the preferences expressed by the demand on the national and international markets. The introduction of an efficient transportation system to move mango exports to international destinations in Europe more efficiently has made the landlocked country a reliable source of the crop. Mali is looking to become one of the world's leading exporters of mangoes. Penina Karibe, CCTV. African countries are moving closer to their goal of creating a continental free trade area linking over 50 different states. Now, you see, early next year, an agreement is expected to be signed between the South and African Trade Bloc, the East African Community, and the Community of Eastern and South and Africa, linking them collectively into Africa's biggest single trade area. So, Mr. Naidu has been looking at the forecast impact of this tripartite free trade area on Sabbath. 26 countries, 625 million people, and a combined GDP of $1.2 trillion. This is the magnitude of Africa's grand free trade area. But not everyone is convinced this ambitious plan will work. Uh, so some of the countries, particularly Angola, Ethiopia, um, the Seychelles, Zimbabwe, are a little bit wary about entering into these big free trade agreements. They'd rather protect their local industries. SADC commands the largest share of the economic pie from these three blocks with a GDP of just over $470 billion. South Africa alone makes up for around $370 billion. So the presence of South Africa helps make SADC overall on the aggregate level a very strong economic block. But as a free trade area, I think you see a lot more dedication to integration in the East African community particularly. SADC certainly has a lot of potential because of the countries that are involved, but in terms of the progress that's been made, it's been very slow. Insufficient infrastructure, stringent immigration laws and government policy are just some of the barriers to trade between African countries. Well, in the short term, I don't think that much will change, and that's for two reasons. First of all, because of the customs and, and the infrastructure problems, which will keep trade low, but also because of the fundamental compatibility between different countries. This deal is very much something for the future. It's something that's being put in place now so that as Africa diversifies, as infrastructure improves, and as economies grow, then Africa can benefit from the growth of its neighbors. But this deal is being mooted as a step in the right direction. The agreement will improve relations and increase trade between African countries. It will also give members of the Grand Free Trade Area greater bargaining power and a presence in the global market. Sumitra Nadu, CCTV. Johannesburg. Up north in Egypt, the Al Ismailia group is buying up old and neglected properties in downtown Cairo in a bit to restore this area to its original historic character. According to the firm, there's no better way to celebrate Cairo's dynamic nature. Downtown Cairo, built between the late 19th and early 20th century, was once heralded as a place of architectural sophistication, but years of neglect have left many of the old buildings in a state of disrepair. The Al Ismailia group has already bought a number of buildings and started renovating them already. They started thinking why not develop this area in a similar way to various other countries like Lebanon, Turkey, Scotland, England, France or Spain. If that model worked abroad, then why not adapt it here in Egypt? 
especially considering we have an exceptional history that can compete with any other country abroad and maybe better it too. The company buys properties and then rents them out to cover the costs of refurbishment. The general manager says that the company is modeled on other regeneration projects across the world. The long-term idea is that we develop the place and bring it back to its original structure while bringing in a tenant or an investor who can give us rent that could allow us to preserve this place and allow for maintenance every five or seven years depending on the needs of the place. These buildings have an architectural art and beautiful heritage but unfortunately they have been neglected for tens of years. This is why I am excited about this project and working with the company because the idea in itself to renovate downtown and bring these buildings back to the original character is an idea that really appeals to me. But not everybody is for the idea. Critics say the project will change the current state of the area. Earlier this year, the governor of Cairo cleared street vendors away from downtown for blocking traffic and trading without a license as part of creating a new look for the place. The Al Ismailia group has reiterated that all stakeholders, including residents and shop owners, are consulted before a project begins. Mahe Mutua, CCTV. Quick run through commodities. This is really all about oil. Uh, 64.45 a barrel. That's the latest number on Brent crude. Uh, still essentially containing uh, the slide we've seen since June to entirely new lows. OPEC, of course, did cut its forecast demand down to about 28.90 million uh, barrels a day for its supply, really, uh, in 2015. Brent crude, of course, fell in response. Is an emergency meeting still on the cards? Maybe, maybe not. OPEC, as far as we're concerned, is still a house divided. Fish farmers in Egypt are exploiting the export markets to revive and in some cases increase their fortunes. Their story is coming up next. Is Asia. Asia means business. Welcome back to the program. Egypt is home to most of Africa's fish farms with an output of over 700,000 tons of fish every year. Now, those in the industry, however, say profits are falling. They claim the production costs are rising and fish prices simply aren't keeping up. In order to reverse their fortunes, fish farm owners are now looking for export markets. Egypt is Africa's largest aquaculture producing country, with an output of around 700,000 tons of fish per year. For these workers at a fish farm in Wadi Ryan, every morning starts the same. They sort tilapia. This farm was established 30 years ago, and now more than 10,000 acres of land is used for fish farming in the area. Tilapia is one of the most popular fish on the Egyptian market. Most of it will be transported to Cairo. More than 80% of these fish are sold in the capital. The rest goes to local traders like Ahmed Fati, who weighs up the catch and loads it into his pickup truck. We come here in the morning, pick up the fish and take it to Bordea. We have a restaurant and a fish shop there. The rest of the load, we sell it to merchants. 
they take 20, 10 or 15 kilos. And when it's all sold, we're done for the day. But the industry is facing problems. Production costs are rising, but fish prices remain the same. Muhammad Gudail said owns several fish farms. He says it's becoming more difficult to make a profit. Some of the challenges we face are the quality and scarcity of water. The government uses a lot of water for agriculture, so our share is small, and this affects our productivity. Another challenge is providing the food for the fish, because most of it is imported, so it's expensive, which affects our production costs. Fish farmers say the price of fish feed has risen by up to 250% in the last seven years, and the farms can only use water from lakes and agricultural runoff. The Nile's waters are reserved for conventional farming. They periodically face shortages due to competition from other farming industries. Goodell said plans to start small-scale exports to the European Union in 2015 in a bid to raise profitability. But scientists don't believe that exports will solve the industry's profitability problems. I think there are, there are opportunities for exports um, and it could make a big difference. Um, I don't think it's the biggest priority uh, because actually um, you know, exporting isn't easy um, and there are markets, domestic markets, which are probably higher priority in terms of, of feeding Egyptian consumers. Dixon says the sector needs long-term improvements. For example, cold storage would increase the lifespan of produce and it could open up new domestic markets by getting farmed fish to areas where it's not currently available. Valdi Karlsa, CCTV. You know how some say good things come in small packages? How's this for a change? One resident in Shanghai is taking it to an entirely new level. He's 60 years old. His name is Xu Xiyun. He's created a, a fully functional but really, really tiny car. It's uh, just about 40 centimetres high, 60 centimetres long and about 35 centimetres wide. That's roughly the size of his suitcase. Top speed, not exactly quick. It's 20 kilometres an hour. But it is fitted with the remote control sound system and two tiny little fans to keep the engine cool. Its creator says it needs just four litres of fuel to run it on a daily basis. He spent two years working on this, assembling it mostly from spare parts which he collected from car repair shops. And collectively, the whole thing cost him $250. Now, legally, he can't drive this on China's roads, but he clearly had quite a bit of fun making it. That's epic. We should get one of those and see if we can run around Canyon Roads here. Uh, okay, onto something that's definitely not fun. Currency is here for you. The Canyon Chilling hitting a three-year low, 90.50, flattening around 90.60 uh, with those levels. The real story really coming out of Nigeria and South Africa. The Naira did post some gains up about 2%. Reserves, however, in the central bank are down by about 19% compared to where they were 12 months ago. South Africa, the Rand hitting a new record, 11.6, weakest since October 2008. But... Focus on the S&P and Fitch ratings, those are coming out on Friday. Are we going to see a rate cut? Probably, probably not. We'll have to wait and see. Here's what we're working on for tomorrow's program, however. We'll be looking at the prospects of a continental free trade area again, but this time from the perspective of where the idea was born, the Ugandan capital of Kampala. And still in Kampala, there's an idea there to make uh, the motorcycle taxes a lot safer. Ensuring the slot is a challenge actuaries dread. We'll tell you why in the next 24 hours. But that's it for this edition of Global Business Africa. Thank you so much for watching. Do send your feedback to globalbusinessafrica at cctv.com. You can also check us out on Facebook and Twitter when we're not on the airwaves. We'll see you over there. And of course, in the next 23 hours, I'm Ramanyan.